Great, let's begin. So welcome everyone um, to our webinar on the consequences of tax immigration. And once again, thanks for HR Talk and um, for hosting us today. So today it's going to be myself and Victoria hosting. Both of us have substantial years of experience in cross-border tax matters with combined experience of over 20 years. We have specific expertise in tax immigration and we can ensure that you have a proper and a compliant exit from South Africa. So if there are any questions, we're going to be answering them at the end of the session. Um, if you do have questions during the session, just pop it in the um, Q&A box or in the chat box, um, and they will all be addressed at the end of the presentation. If you do want to um, verbally ask a question at the end, um, just use the raise the hand icon um, and you'll be unmuted so that we can um, answer your question. So just to go through the disclaimer, um, whilst today's webinar um, on the consequence of tax immigration, it is a high level overview of tax immigration. For specific circumstances, please do seek professional advice. Thank you, Erin. Great. So we are here to discuss quite a few topics today, all pertaining to tax immigration. The first one will be how you determine tax residency in South Africa, how it is considered by our legislation, how you're considered to be tax resident. Uh, then we'll move on to the application of the double tax agreement rules, how to make use of them to get tax credits, tax reliefs. Then we'll go on to the process of breaking your tax residency, how to formally do it through SARS, what are the correct ways. Then we will move on to something called the deemed disposal, which is actually the exit tax. Uh, it is a very important part of tax immigration. Challenges uh, faced by expatriates, we will talk about that also quite a bit. Uh, there are several factors uh, that come into play. And then we'll move on to withholding tax regulations. Uh, again, something that could be quite nice in getting tax credits, tax reliefs. And finally, we'll close it off with retirement annuities, pensions, provident funds, all new retirement vehicles, and what happens to them upon exit. Great, let's dive right in. Um, the world really has three types of different tax systems be it the residence-based tax system, the citizenship-based tax system, and the source-based tax system. They all vary in the way they consider someone, uh, how they're going to be taxed and what they're going to be taxed on. South Africa used to be a source-based tax system, and back in 2001, we switched to a residence-based tax system. Now, on the residence-based tax system, they look at your tax residency, not your citizenship, not the source of funds. Um, the way they look at you, if you're a tax resident, you're taxed on your worldwide income, not just your local income. And if you're a tax non-resident, so if you tax immigrate, so then you're looked at for your local South African income only. Now, why you have to cease tax residency? The reason for that is because the burden of proof, the onus of proof, falls onto each taxpayer themselves to prove anything, declare anything, make amendments, submit. <clears throat> Um, nothing is automatically changed. Therefore, even if you do break our residency tests, uh, you're still considered a tax resident until the point that you do formally change your status. Uh, speaking of residency tests, I'm going to hand over to Erin to talk us through it. Thanks, Victoria. Um, and, and as Victoria said, so South Africa is a residency-based tax system. So irrespective of where your income is earned, if you are tax residents in South Africa, you are required to pay tax on your worldwide income. Um, contrasting non-residents would only pay tax on their South African sourced income. So from a um, South African residency test perspective, there are two tests. The first being the ordinarily residence test, which is a subjective test. Now, whilst it's not... Um, Whilst there's no definition in place of what ordinarily residence is defined as, um, case law as well as SARS interpretation notes indicate that it is the place you will return to after your wanderings. And there's no time frame that stipulates that. So if you have gone abroad, um, whether you're there for two, three, five, ten years, if SARS identifies that your intent is to return to South Africa, then they will deem you to be a South African tax resident. Now, the below list, um, whilst it's not exhaustive, these are just guidelines of what SARS would look at. So they would look at your intention, so your intent um, upon exit out of South Africa, um, your most um, fixed place of settlement, your habitual abode, so where are you spending majority of your time, where is your business and your personal interests, employment, economic factors, 
um, the status in the Republic, um, as well as other countries, where your belongings located, nationality, citizenship, family, social relations, um, and then they'll even dive into some more scrutiny in terms of cultural, political, other interests and activities, how long you've been abroad for, what was the purpose of being abroad, the nature of that time abroad, as well as any visits back to South Africa, how long you were back in South Africa, and then um, the reasons that you came back to South Africa. SARS is very, quite, can get quite scrutiny in terms of, of looking at this. And as I said, this is subjective. So it's your word against SARS um, word. So there's quite a prominent case um, years back where um, someone had exited South Africa, they were in their new country, they were making their tax submissions um, in that new country and had deemed themselves to be non-South African tax residents. SARS investigated the case, they had a golf membership in South Africa, and SARS used that golf membership as a tie back to South Africa and deemed them to be South African tax residents based on their golf membership. So whilst you could tick all of these boxes, we, we have gone through this list now and say, oh, you know, I might only just have my medical aid back in South Africa, just be very wary of that because SARS can use that um, to deem you to be a South African tax resident. As you said, Erin, it's not objective. It's very subjective. And again, the burden of proof is on you. The secondary test, um, as we call it, is the physical presence test. Uh, it's not subjective like the ordinary residence test. It's very black and white. Um, it is a day's test, a calendar test. Um, if we look at it through here, so to be deemed physically present and a resident, you're considered to be physically in South Africa for a period exceeding 91 days in aggregate during the relevant year of assessment, as well as for a period of exceeding 91 days during these the past five years of assessment, and for a total period or exceeding periods of 915 days in aggregate in those five, five past preceding years of assessment. So as you can see, it's an end test. It's not a one or two or three of these. You'd have to meet all of these criteria to meet the physical presence test. Uh, an important part to consider when doing tax immigration is the date you left South Africa, the day you want to be deemed as seizing your tax residency, as this will trigger tax consequences down the line. Um, and it's quite a, an important severe tax consequence that it could trigger. So it is very important to speak to your tax advisor um, about it. Now, a, a third um, kind of ruling that does happen is that if a person ceases to be resident, um, when, when a person ceases to be resident, if that person is physically outside of South Africa for a continuous period of at least 330 days, then the residents will then cease from the day that person left the Republic which is quite an important factor to remember when doing your tax immigration. Mm. Okay. Definitely. Thanks, Victoria. And I think also, um, so, so we've spoken about these two tests. So you'd apply the first one being the ordinarily residence test. If at any year of assessment you cease your residency by, by that ordinarily residence test, you then move on to the physical presence test and assess, assess yourself in that manner. Um, and Victoria took us through how you would be deemed to be resident by the physical presence test. We're now going to um, have a look at an example of breaking your tax residency. So let's say, for instance, you've assessed yourself by the ordinarily residence test. You've deemed yourself um, looking at that list. You, you've said you now your intent is to move abroad. You're no longer ordinarily resident in South Africa. You've gone to the secondary test, being the physical presence test. You've assessed yourself from the days factor. You've deemed yourself from that. Um, you counted your days and you are now no longer South African tax resident on that. So let's say you've made your exit out of South Africa and now you now want to return in the following year of assessment to South Africa, whether it's for holiday, work, whatever it may be, you want to come back into the Republic. Super important to note is if you come back into the Republic for more than 91 days in the following year, of assessment after your exit and you're in South Africa for more than 91 days, it triggers the physical presence test once again. And again, as Victoria had mentioned, um, for these three bullet points, you would then obviously tick the first bullet point, potentially the second bullet point, because it's, you know, you for the you've only exited South Africa in the preceding year. So you still take ticking point um two and three. And so then your residency would not have ceased in that year. And it just brings in a, a whole bunch of complexities 
if you are going to return to South Africa um, and stay in the Republic for more than 91 days. So super important to assess yourself on your days as well. And we see this lots. I mean, there's uh, quite a few clients that say to us, I don't want to return permanently to live in South Africa, but I do want to spend my summers there, for example. And that easily could trigger more than the 91 days. So it's it's very important to be wary of this and, and look at the days that you spend in and out. And it's not to say that you can't spend that much amount of time. You mm. just have to be very cautious and speak to your tax advisor, do it the proper way. Um, have your reports, your opinions, things like that stated and done professionally so that they can be protect your now, not now non-residency. I mean, Erin, I think you've had a client recently that had a similar yes. situation. Yep, she had exited South Africa. She had wanted to then the following year come back to South Africa um, and she'd already spent a couple of um, days in the Republic. So it was a, a second return to South Africa and she wanted to come for a period of 20 further days. Um, and in doing so, it would have sparked her residency and brought in a whole bunch of complexities as well. So at that point, it was easier for her to um, just actually shorten her holiday and shorten her visit to South Africa and, and come the following tax year, um, you know, just to ensure that her residency was broken correctly and in the correct in the correct manner. Perfect. All right, let's move on to double tax agreement. So... This, this double tax agreement snippet is from the United Kingdom. Um, double tax agreements exist between um, multiple countries. So, so there are a whole bunch of these. This is just the United Kingdom one. Um, but most of them look in, um, in, in this format as well from Article 4 from the residency perspective. So if you are um, caught under the local laws of the United Kingdom as a taxpayer, so you've assessed the local laws and you're a tax resident in the UK from, from that and perspective, and you've assessed the local laws in South Africa, being the ordinarily residence um, test and the physical presence test, and you are deemed a South African taxpayer, then what's happened is you are caught by both of the jurisdictions as being as being tax resident. In this scenario, when this happens, you have to then go to the double taxation agreement, find the article that pertains to residency, and assess each factor to determine where your tax residency lies. In some cases, you might have to do this each year. Sometimes you only have to do it once. So looking at this article in more detail, so we'd look at point A. If you can't assess yourself and answer the question as to where you resident from point A, you'd move on to point B. If you still can't, you'd move on to point C. If you still can't identify it, you'd move on to point D. So taking a look at this um, in some detail, the first point is where is your permanent home available? So if you can cut and clear, say my permanent home is available in the United Kingdom, then that's where your tax residency would lie and you would follow the rules um, in terms of that from a tax perspective. If you can't answer that and, and you have a permanent home in both of the jurisdictions, you'd move on to point B. Now, point B refers to where you habitually abode, which is where have you spent majority of your time. Again, if you can answer that quite clearly, that would be your country of tax residency. If you can't answer um, and you've spent, um, you know, the same amount of time in each of the jurisdictions um, or quite close amount of time, then you would then move on to point C and assess yourself via your nationality. And that would be where your tax residency lies. If still, if you've got dual nationality and you still can't assess yourself, you'd move on to um, point D. And this is where the authorities would step in. And by mutual agreement, they would identify where your tax residency lies um, based on the information that's provided to them. I think, Erin, this is, I mean, it's important to note that it's an end test. I mean, it's a, it's not an end test. It's an if test. Mm. So, if, yeah. And it, it looks quite simple when you say, oh, well, my permanent home might be here or there. But it's it's not as simple as that, is it? No, definitely not. Um, and, and this is where um, professional advice is really advised because permanent home, the definition of a permanent home is also so important. So it's not just merely where you actually own a home or, or no, if you if your name's on the title deed, it's not actually just that. It could be, do you have a home available? Um, whether mm. it's family home, whether it's a rental home. So it does, it, the scope of it's so wide. So it really does need thorough um, assessment. Brilliant. Right, we will move on to deemed disposal section 9H charge, or as we like to call it in the industry, the exit charge. Um, 
So what happens when you seize your tax residency or tax immigrate, as it is referred financially immigrate, you know, there's many terms for it. Uh, but what happens is that you are deemed to have disposed, sold off all your capital assets, your worldwide capital assets, and we acquired them again on the day before you seize tax residency. This triggers a capital gains tax event. The reason for this is not SARS just being greedy. Okay. The reason for this is because when you become tax non-resident, they no longer have the right to tax you on capital gains tax unless it is a South African property or property business of sorts. Um, the reasoning now that they want to charge you this final exit tax is that they say, whilst you're tax resident, if you remain tax resident, we would have had you dispose these in one day and gotten the capital gains tax from it. Uh, what happens is they look at the day before seizing tax residency. They look at the value when you acquired the asset versus that day. And whatever gain or loss there happen to be, that's how they determine the capital gains tax. Now, uh, it seems quite daunting and it, it can be. However, not everything is included in it. Excluded assets are South African property. The reason for that, again, as we said, is that when when you do dispose of your property in South Africa, actually dispose of it, actually sell it off. That is when the capital gains event will happen and that will be taxed in South Africa. Uh, then South African bank accounts, any personal use assets, cars, furniture, you know, clothing, things like that. Anything personal use is excluded from the capital gains tax event and retirement vehicles, which is important. Uh, they did try at one point to bring that in, but luckily it did not go through. Now, what is included? This is where we need to look at it very carefully. Uh, foreign property. So remember, local property is excluded, but foreign property is considered for this. So if you have a family home from ancestors or whatever it is, or you bought a holiday home, you decide to seize your tax residence, you need to be very aware of when you do it, how you do it, and are very careful that this doesn't fall into this CGT tax event because it, it, it will get considered for it. Uh, any shares, both again local and foreign, if you have any companies, you're a shareholder, director of any companies, you have to be very careful with that. Any trusts, again, local and foreign. Crypto, uh, any kind of uh, currency like that. Any investments, stock bonds, any collectibles. Um, and again, I keep harping on this, but it is all local and foreign, all global tax assets. People do seem to confuse it and assume it's just my South African stuff. It's not. Remember when you're tax resident, it is your worldwide income and assets that get considered by SARS. They have the right to that. So it is any capital assets. And we do get some strange ones. I mean, Erin, what was the case we were looking at? Um, yes. Yeah. So so I suppose to, to dive into how, how much SARS can look at this and, and the wide net that's cast over Section 9H is, Victoria, how would a racing horse um, be fall into the net or not? Good question. So a racing horse is not just a horse that sits... Uh, you know, and it is there for whatever use you might have, but it's it's used in a business sense. Um, so it is seen as like having a capital value. So if you were to dispose of it, you would have a capital gains tax event that happens. So the Sorry, I think we've just lost Victoria. Just one moment. Okay, just while we get um Victoria back, um she's just dropped off. Um so so just to clarify on the on the racing horse example, as Victoria had said, um it is um in terms of a business sense, so it would fall in the scope of a CGT event upon exit. Um and other things that you could um that just off the top of my head that I'm considering is also like art and paintings that would also form part of the um, CGT net upon exit out of South Africa. So it really is um, a wide net that's cast over your assets and whether those assets are held globally, um, you know, out offshore in your other country, anywhere offshore, or whether they're held in South Africa. Um, and I think it's quite pertinent to, pertinent to actually, um, yeah, just, just to let you know how important it is to ensure um, that, that you really do look at all your assets um, and assess them um, 
because SARS does have knowledge of these things. Um, and Victoria is back. Apologies for that. <laughs> no worries. Um, I think um, I think that rounds up the section 9H charge. And I think before we move on to other factors, and just to tie up this section of the webinar, I think it's fundamental to note that in some cases, you may qualify for your residency to be backdated. Um, and based on what Victoria has just said, and um, with regards to the extra charge out of South Africa, I think it's quite important from a tax liability perspective to just make sure that that date of exit is really assessed properly. Yeah, that's where a good tax planner and tax advisor comes into play. Great, let's move on to challenges faced by expatriates. Um, we've got an example on the screen. Um, here is someone that's earning kind of the average salary in the UK, being the 611,000 plus minus rands or 27,000 plus minus pounds. Now, what happens if you haven't seized your tax residency in South Africa? Because you're living in the UK, you've met the criteria, you're not a tax resident there as well. You're a tax resident in both jurisdictions. It can happen that you're a tax resident in three, four jurisdictions. It all depends on where you've resided, where you've traveled, what the jurisdiction's rules of residency are. Uh, but in this specific scenario, and it's quite a common scenario, um, what happens is that because the individual hasn't seized tax residency in one of the other states, they both tax resident of both. And now both sides are saying we have a right to tax you on your worldwide income. Now, you can see clearly on the left is South Africa, how South Africa would tax on the same income in the United Kingdom on the right, how they would tax you on the same income. Well, what happens is you're not going to pay both, but there's a potential taxation on both jurisdictions, but with the higher of the two of the tax obligations will take precedence. In this specific scenario, South Africa is significantly higher. So the South African tax is where you would end up paying this. And you can see it is significantly higher. I mean, Erin, we are looking at close to double. Yeah, so it's it's quite... So, I mean, if, if, I, if someone didn't see say, South African tax residency in the correct manner, you're ultimately paying an additional, what, that's about £3,200. Um, I think it equates to around seventy two thousand rand extra on the income, yeah. um, and and it's and it's such a hefty amount. Whereas, um, you know, in a lot of cases, actually ceasing your tax residency and getting an advisor would actually be the cheaper option in this case. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there's other uh, challenges that are faced by expatriates. So SARS is not uh, exactly uh, hiding the fact that they are going after South Africans abroad. They think that is where the, the money or where they can gather quite a lot of tax. Uh, it, the pot is low. We know that there's deficits. Uh, so, I mean, if you just think about the past five, six years, there have been, I can count on two hands, actually, how many legislation changes have been to do with expatriates and how they are taxed. So it, it is definitely important to look at and consider your tax status in both jurisdictions. Mm. And I think you touched on it earlier, Victoria. I think it's also um, so important to know um, the head in the sand approach definitely is not going to work. SARS is aware, um, the jurisdictions do speak to each other, um, SARS is aware of what you do have. Yeah, there's the automatic exchange of information that goes about. If they decide to look into it, they have the absolute right to look into it, not just with your what you're declaring in another country, but what you have financially. They can speak to banks, they can speak to investment institutions it's it's quite broad hmm. great speaking of investments and things like that let's move on to withholding tax yes so i think um to not to paint negative picture around the whole exit um, and <laughs> and there are positives to it one of the positives here is a withholding tax so withholding tax is a final tax which is levied on non-residents and um, each source of income whether it's royalties sale of property or land um interest they all have a different withholding tax rate. So this little snippet um, at the bottom of the screen here is um, from the Australian double taxation agreement. So dividends in South Africa are subject to a 20% withholding tax rate. The net dividend is then paid out to that non-resident shareholder. Now, if you are in this scenario, if you are Australian tax resident, um, you are able to look at the double taxation agreement and see what that double taxation agreement stipulates from a withholding tax perspective. So, like I said here, South Africa's got 20% withholding tax rate on dividends. 
Australia's got, per this agreement over here, 15%. So there'd be a bunch of forms that would need to be completed through SARS. Once you've got those relative, for, relative forms and certificates, you would then um, send that across to your um, the company who's issuing out the dividends, and they would be able to withhold the tax at the 15%, um, as that's what the double taxation agreement says as the maximum there, which means that you've got a 5% saving um, on those dividends, um, on that dividend tax. I think it's also important to note that this is actually not utilized a lot. I don't think people are actually aware of how much um, they can go and save. And um, this is just one example of Australia and South Africa. Um, you know, if this was down to 10%, a lot of the agreements are 10%, and um, there could be a 10% saving. Um, and again, this is on dividends. And um, there's so many different sources of income. So it's really a great tool um, to have um, from a tax saving perspective. Absolutely. And there's so many other benefits as well, be it uh, interest as well as a non-resident. You know, you can save a lot on that uh, tax-wise. Um, donations tax as a non-resident, um, you don't qualify for that at all. So that's a nice benefit to know if you want to send money into South Africa. You don't have to worry about donations tax and any limitations. You know, if you want to gift something to brother, sister, daughter, whatever it might be. Uh yeah, there's a ton of these. So do speak to your tax advisor. It is, there's a lot of tax uh, reliefs that can apply. Let's move on to our final topic, uh, which is retirement funds on immigration. So it's another perk, uh, as we like to say. It is basically, uh, as you most of you do know, your retirement in South Africa, you can take out a third early or... Um, wait until maturity which is your retirement age to be able to take it out now it used to be in full now it is again one third and then the other two thirds you put into an annuity or that type of sort of thing um it used to be when you seize your tax residency when you become non-resident you were allowed to withdraw in full right away uh which is a wonderful perk a lot of people use that to uh, set up their new life or reinvest or you know whatever it might be now, the rules have changed a little bit. We'll touch on that a little later, but the benefit is still there. That's the important thing. The thing that isn't as great when you withdraw early is that you get taxed on the withdrawal lump sum table. It is significantly less of a tax benefit you get. Uh, so you will be taxed anything from uh, one rent 27,500 is zero tax. However, from that, then you jump onto the tables of 18%, 27%, 36%. Um, so it's important to know that, yes, you can take out your um, retirement pot in full. However, you will be taxed on the withdrawal lump sum table if you take it before maturity. Erin um, will take us through the other option. Mm. So if, if the option... Um is that you would want to wait until retirement age and then withdraw your um, lump sum. Um, th then you could do that. You would then be taxed on, on this retirement fund lump sum benefit or severance benefits table, which the first five, 550,000 is tax free. Um, and the screen before where Victoria showed you the slide of that table, I always like to call it the punitive um, tax table because it really is. Um, you're not getting a lot out of it after you've been taxed, um, you know, after 27,500, which is not great. Um, so, so up to this rate, yeah, so if the first 550,000 is tax-free, then again, you're taxed at the 18, 27, and 36%, depending on how much um, you're withdrawing. I think it's also important to to just note here is a lot of people try and use these retirement funds um, as, as tools to, to start their new life um, abroad. And um, just to note that obviously consider the tax consequences and then also weigh up, you know, whether you withdraw it now um, before retirement age um, and paying the punitive rate versus waiting till retirement um, and paying um, the larger rate at uh, the lesser rate, but then also weighing up, you know, the FX rate and how you're going to hedge your risk um, because there's so many different moving parts to this and um, not just the tax in South Africa that plays a part in, in moving those funds abroad. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a significant, if we look at the previous table again, only 27,500 tax-free versus the 550. I mean, that's quite a huge jump on what you can get if you wait. Uh, however, like you said, Erin, you don't know other factors. So mm. do consider your FX rates, your future, what, you know, our local interest rates, which are great in terms of that. So there is a lot to consider. 
Um, moving on to what has changed in terms of these retirement annuities. Uh, again, like I said, it's one of the many changes that has come about uh, to do with uh, expatriate tax, as we like to call it. Uh, so again, you're still allowed to withdraw your full retirement, should you wish, uh, upon tax emigrating. However, now they've put in a three-year lock rule. Uh, basically, it's if you have to be three years non-resident before you're allowed to withdraw it in full. Uh, now, like Erin mentioned a bit earlier, is that some cases are lucky enough that can be backdated, so that does help. However, you ha it, it might be the case that you have to wait for three years to take this out. Um, again, depends on the, everyone's situation. Some people might prefer it. Some people might be worried. Uh, you know, early withdrawal, it's going to affect people that need the money right away to set up their lives abroad. Uh, the most inconvenience, I'd say, is is the guys that are considering and want to invest it already abroad. The reason SARS has done this is because there are been lots of cases in the past where people just seize their tax residency, take their retirement funds out, pretend they're immigrating, and then come back and just reinvest and do whatever they want, spend the money in another way. Uh, this, of course, has left it big scrutiny and now caused this three-year lock-in rule. Uh, it's getting a little bit more complex. I mean, Erin, I think we've got a new one coming, a new legislation now as well. Yep. So there is draft legislation. Um, and as Victoria mentioned earlier, um, the focus on expatriates is large um, and, and all these legislative changes are coming in. So new ones are um, looking to be enacted. Um, it's not yet an enactment, um, but that's looking to come in from March of next year. It's in the process. Victoria um, mentioned over here the three-year lock rule. Um, so just to, to really just put it in layman terms and, and sort of what the new rule would encompass is the three-year lock rule could potentially now mean a six-year lock rule. It's not as simple as that, but that's potentially what could happen um, in terms of, of, of immigrating offshore and trying to get these funds funds out of your retirement um, vehicle. Yeah, if it's something you're thinking of, let's say go read out, there's quite a bit of stuff out there, or do reach out to your practitioner. They are, uh, it's called a two-part retirement system, so keep an eye out for that. There has been many, many changes, many uh, legislation changes. We don't know what's going to come about in the future. So do try to keep afloat, speak to the professionals, know what you're doing, go in with a plan, with a roadmap. Great. Um, and we've reached the recap stage. Uh, we're going to now just discuss the points that we went through. Uh, so please do plan your questions for us. They're coming up soon. Uh, so we started off the webinar uh, speaking about uh, the fact that South Africa is a tax residency system and how we determine tax residency. Uh, we had the ordinarily residence test and the physical presence test. Um, there are the two tests for, for the African tax residency. It is important to dive into those very specifically with your practitioner. Uh, ordinarily residence test being more subjective and the physical presence test being more objective. Um, do you also consider your other jurisdictions and where you become tax resident there as well? Yeah, exactly that. And and it's also important um, when you're doing this assessment is, and, and we spoke about the double taxation agreement rules, is you can't just assess um, South Africa. You really have to look at that other jurisdiction. And, and we touched on that double taxation agreement between the UK and South Africa. Um, and just to make a note that it, it, it's not as simple as just sort of doing that assessment and looking at what's on the paper, but really to assess everything, um, you know, in total. Um, and not just um, land item items. Yeah, and I mean, reminder to you guys as well, like Aaron said, there is, it's the end, it's the end test. So it's, it got dives in quite in detail. You have to be quite certain and you don't want to get to that final part where they have to decide for you. Um, great, then we moved on to the process of breaking tax residency and how to notify SARS. Again, it is important to uh, delve into the fact that there's going to be a documentary evidence needed. Uh, the burden is on you. Always remember that. The burden of proof is on the taxpayer um, for everything, be it uh, your normal assessment that gets done on your tax return, your normal IRP5 and any documents they require there, all the way through to this final seizing of your tax residency. 
to your final deregistration from SARS, should you wish to do that. You need to be aware of how you notify things. If nothing automatically happens, you need to be letting SARS know and formally seizing your tax residency, tax immigrating, as we call it. Mm. And, and super important. And I think, um, and, and we don't really touch on this a lot, but just to touch on, I think a lot of people at a young age, they go abroad and they start to live abroad um, and then they decide they're not going to come back to South Africa. They've never been a taxpayer in South Africa. So in their mind, there's nothing to do, um, but there is something to do. And there are consequences of not doing anything. Um, so, so I think it's important to note that anyone who's got South African citizenship or who by birth was here, they need to make sure that they've assessed themselves to see if this would be relevant or not. Um, Absolutely. But, and yeah, even thanks. people, just to add to that, Erin, even people that have left so long ago that they think it's nothing important, but they've got an inheritance situation happening in South Africa, an investment situation, anything, anything to do with South Africa, any ties you've had by birth, just like Erin said, any ties you've had by inheritance, by investment, just get assessed. Mm, exactly. And I think, like you said there with the inheritance, um, yeah, it, it's going to create a problem and pose a problem, um, quite a significant one, if, if you haven't ceased your tax residency and you've got inheritance sitting in South Africa. To get that offshore is going to be um, quite difficult unless you follow the proper protocol. Yeah. All right. We then moved on to um, the concept of a deemed disposal. So that's at section 9H charge, not a NAS charge, um, ass assessing your worldwide assets um, and, and also looking at quite specific assets that you may have that you would think would fall outside of the net, really just assessing it all um, and, and how that um, is, is deemed um, to be disposed of when you exit um, out of South Africa. Great. Um, the challenges faced by expatriates, I mean, you don't want to be double taxed. Uh, these agreements do exist, double taxation agreements, the way to seize your tax residency, tax immigration, there's all, it's, there's all these aspects that can help you. But remember, it's not automatically applied. You have to, have to, have to do your due diligence, apply correctly, do it professionally, do it the legal ways. Um, there are so many challenges, so many changes in legislation it's daunting for expatriates. You do move abroad your entire life. You want to, uh, you know, there's so many reasons people leave um, that you, and every single one of them is tied back to tax. Unfortunately, you cannot escape that so easily. So do make sure you have your affairs in order. And and then we went on to withholding tax, just a quite a nice one. Um, assess yourself under the double taxation agreement. Have a look to see what um, income source income you're earning in South Africa, see if the double taxation agreement has a lower rate um, you know, and, and just make sure you can have um, a bit of tax saving in that manner. Yep, and there's so many perks that come along you know, with, with tax emigrating. I mean, we, I think we, we don't want to scare all you guys. We've spoken about all the, the, the scary things, I think, so far. But I mean, withholding tax relief is one of the um, retirement annuities, as we touched on. That's a great tax... Uh, efficiency. I think the main, main positive of tax immigrating is that SARS can no longer tax your foreign income and assets. That's the important part. So don't forget why you are considering this. You have moved abroad or you're going to, or you've got family that is living abroad. They need to protect that foreign income and assets. They need to ensure that SARS is, no, no, that SARS is not reaching for it and putting it in their pocket. Hmm. Thanks, Great. Victoria. Victoria is going to take us um, through some um, positives of how we can help you. Great. So we offer full service in terms of tax immigration. We actually offer full service in terms of all other tax aspects. Um, but let's speak about tax immigration, the topic of the day. So uh, a service we offer at first is called a tax health check. It's basically we dive into your uh, profile, tax profile in South Africa, and we can also some other jurisdictions as well. And we ensure that you are tax compliant, you've done things the correct way, what should be done, how it can be done, and we advise you in terms of that as well. Um, it's a full dive into your tax profile and efficiency. So we can, you know, advise you the best way. Then we move on to the tax residency opinion. It's a full on professional opinion on where you should be tax residents and what what criteria you meet and what you qualify for. And then we have the actual application to seize your tax residency, to tax immigrates. 
And we also do offer something called the application for international transfer. You guys would maybe know it as the foreign uh, foreign foreign investment allowance it used to be. Um, sorry, it was a mouthful. <laughs> Uh, basically, when you become non-resident, you need a clearance from SARS to be able to move your funds abroad. That is what the certificate would be. Um, and then we also can help you with any cross-border tax matter. Mm. Um, and what, what we also offer is, um, and thanks, Victoria, for taking us through that. Um, and, and whilst you've listed there, I mean, the scope of what we do is, is really vast. So reach out to us if there's something that we haven't listed um, in addition, we also offer a free 15 minute no obligation assessment. So if you're unsure of whether this needs to happen um, or you or you haven't to say or you want to assess yourself upon the criteria, we're here to help. Um, so you can book um, a free 15 minute consultation. This is the link. The slides are going to be made available to you after the webinar. Um, and then if you've got something scenario specific, you can also reach out to us um, and email us um, on our email, which is residency at salesolutions.co.uk. Thank you, Erin. I think we're going to now move on to the questions. Great. So I think, yeah, let's wait a couple of minutes. Let's see. Um, if you do want to ask a question verbally, um, just raise your hand um, and you'll be um, unmuted so that you can um, discuss your query with us. Would you like to maybe go through a few scenarios of questions, typical questions that we get? Yes. Um, oh, you put me on the spot there. Um, <laughs> sure. A um, typical question is, um, okay, let me pose this one to you, Victoria. Um, so what happens if, um, so let's say I left South Africa in 2001. My family is still in South Africa um, and my grandmother's recently passed away and she has left inheritance and I'd like to take it out. Um, would I have to? What would I have to do in order to do that? That is a good one, actually, Erin. Um, it's quite common. So a lot of people have left just before two thousand March two thousand one when we became a tax residency system. Um, so they think, oh, I don't have to. There was no such thing as tax residency when I left, so I don't need to do anything. I don't need to change my residency status. There was no such thing. Unfortunately, that's not the case. There's a whole bunch of red tape. So with inheritance, what happens is that. Um, it has to be declared to SARS when you receive it. And to be able to receive it, you have to have shown that you're non-resident status to be able to receive the funds abroad. The solicitors, the state won't release the funds to you without that certificate, uh, with that letter of non-residency confirmation. Mm, thanks, Victoria. Um, and what happens, um, let's say I've done the process now, I've gone ahead with it, um, sales help me, I have um, ceased my tax residency, I'd now like to um, take the funds abroad, am I able to do so? Yes, you can. Uh, with inheritance straight away, you can take it out. The You can have it paid out abroad, actually, which is great. I say that because um, for the retirement policies, if you withdraw them, you can't actually have them paid out straight abroad. You have to receive them in your local bank account, local non-resident bank account that is specifically in your name. Um, and then you have to move the funds abroad from there. And with that comes the AIT, actually, um, which you'd need the clearance for that as well. So you can see there's a whole lot of um, obstacles almost, let's call it uh, documentary obstacles that happen in all these mm. scenarios. Uh, let me pose one for you, Erin. Um, and then I see we do have a few questions. My last one for you is, I don't have a South African passport. I've given that up. Uh, what happens? Can SARS touch, still touch me? I mean, I've, I'm not even a citizen anymore. Yeah, exactly. And I think that stems back to, if I recall, slide three, where um, South Africa is a residency-based system. Um, so it doesn't matter where your citizenship may be. Um, you would still need to do the formal um, exit out of South Africa and um, still follow the um, correct protocol um, still assess yourself from an um, exit charge assessment as well. Um, so just yeah, relinquishing your citizenship um, doesn't doesn't necessarily spark an exit out of South Africa from a tax perspective. Great. Um, I've got a question uh, from Andrew. Right. Uh, he says, my children are South African, but not registered provisional taxpayers in South Africa. They are now going to work in the UK using a graduate visa after completing studies in the UK. Are there any SARS requirements to address the risk of double taxation? 
Mm. Good one. Um, so in terms of this, Andrew, I think um, there are some different um, reliefs that you'd look at in terms of this, if the intention is just to study there and not to um, permanently reside abroad. Um, if the intention is to permanently reside abroad, it brings into question a lot of um, other things that need to be assessed. Um, but from a double taxation um, perspective, there's an allowance for Section 1010, and that means that if someone is abroad and working abroad, um, if they remain outside of South Africa for 183 days, 60 of those need to be consecutive, then um, up to a certain limit can be tax-free in South Africa. It still needs to be declared in South Africa, and the application of that relief needs to be claimed on the tax return, but there is a limit um, um, before they would need to be taxed in South Africa. Any foreign tax that is paid in the UK um, they would get a credit um, in South Africa. Yeah. And then we've got another question uh, from Philip. Great. Philips asks, if you work for a UK company, contract or part-time, and you stay in South Africa, what is the process to register for tax? Cool. Do you want to take that one, Victoria? Sure. So, so if you work for a UK company and you stay in South Africa, um, you, the process to register for tax would be the standard process, really. Um, you are physically working in South Africa providing that service, so then you, your income is kind of deemed to be South African. It's not as simple as that, so I do suggest maybe give us a, a call in the 15 minutes and we can have a, a discussion on that. But uh, it's not as simple as I'm being paid by your com company, so it's the foreign income it actually is probably most likely going to be deemed as local South African income. So you have to register as a normal South African taxpayer and declare that normally and be taxed in the marginal income tax rates. Mm. Great. Thanks, Victoria. Great. Let's wait if there's any more questions. Any last ones you can think of, Erin, that are the mm. quite standard ones we get? Um, standard ones. Um... Hmm. What happens in the instance um, where I've lost my documentation? I've lost my, I don't have my exit and entry stamp um, into my foreign country. Um, how do I then prove to SARS that I've left? Wow, okay, that is quite a complex one. That is a very <laughs> difficult one. <laughs> so what happens there is you've got a couple of choices um, and this is where you would need a, a very expert, <laughs> very much an expert in the field to help you out. If you don't have documentary proof backdating you, uh, you might have to do a current, what we call a current exit. Um, and that might be risky because of the Section 9H, the deemed disposal charge. Um, however, there might be other ways we'd have to speak to SARS to see what they consider, what they consider affidavits and other things like that. Um, but again, it is, uh, I think it, it just speaks to the point that the burden of proof is on the taxpayer. Keep all your documents, even if you hear of things after five years, you don't have to keep documents up or whatever. Keep mm. your documents, such as passports, egg trees, exits. Keep all of that. Uh, Documentation proof is very important. Keep it forever. We've had people, I mean, I think the furthest back I've had to backdate someone is to 90, 1986. Um, mm. Luckily, that person had all the documents, uh, which you yeah. can imagine is 30-odd uh, something years of documentary proof, but you, you have to keep your documents. Erin, I mean, mm. anything you'd like to add to that one? Yeah, I think exactly that. It's a super complex um, situation. And I think um, I think the biggest um, risk that you face is the Section 9H charge. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, get in contact with us. Ask us your questions. And we're happy to assess you. We're happy to have a con conversation with you. Um, a lot of this can be super daunting. Um, but but we're here to help. We're here to support. We're here to guide. So, yeah, really do reach out to us. Um, even if it doesn't go anything further, we really want to um, assist you. Um, and just make sure that you're aware of, of the consequences um, of tax immigration. Great. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We hope it was uh, useful and educational. Great. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Victoria. We look forward to chatting to you all more. Thank you. Bye-bye.